Hello, how art thou? Um, this is a video that I am making again for fun to teach the youth about the six string guitar. Because some people are starting to play seven guitar, the Metlers play seven, guitar, seven string guitars. Probably play seven guitars actually, all in one go. Um, overly ostentatious in my opinion. Always looking for the next thing to try and up each other with. Um, it's an awful battle of testosterone. Um, right, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a big Velvet Underground fanatic. Have been ever since I was a teenager. Who isn't a Velvet Underground fanatic? Uh, I wonder. Um, they made several records. Uh, there's two different versions of that group in my opinion, if not three. Um, the first being the incarnation with John Cale. Or Lou Reed uh, decided to get rid of him. And the second being uh, with Doug Yule. And then the third being with just Doug Yule and Lou Reed on uh, the Velvet Underground's last album, Loaded. Um, and then beyond that, in fact, uh, for those of you who don't know, that uh, Doug Yule then took the name and uh, continued to uh, operate under the name Velvet Underground. In fact, the only time that the Velvet Underground toured as the Velvet Underground, bar the time they reunited in 1993, when I was doing my leaving search, um, was with Dougie Yule's incarnation of the band, at which stage Lou Reed had left. And there's a very funny story actually about David Bowie um, going to New York and wanting to meet the Velvet Underground, and he met uh, Lou Reed at Max's Kansas City and he had a long conversation with him. And when he came back, his manager said, no, that's not Lou Reed. He left the band years ago. That's Doug Yule. So Bowie never got to meet them uh, at that time, at least. Um, so there's a few things about the Velvet Underground, some secrets that I'm going to share that I think, at least, that not many people realise. And that is um, that they were fond of uh, experimentation, as we know. Um, John Cale famously came from a classical background and he was part of the movement of minimalism, uh, which minimalism would include composers like John Cage, uh, to some degree Steve Reich, and uh, what's his name, Philip Glass. And more importantly, he was part of the Dream Syndicate with what's his name? Um, it'll come back to me. I don't know why it's just blanked. Uh, Lamont Young, thank you. And uh, with Lamont Young, he had spent an awful lot of time, I think he'd become disenchanted with music. In fact, I read that uh, John Cale was the Velvet Underground's only hope of they could register their songs if they wrote them down or would have given them an extra income. But Cale was so anti-music at that stage, or at least so uh, anti or opposed to the Academy, they refused to do it. And uh, his cohort, his buddies lost out on money that could otherwise have been made quite easily. Um, and I think a few things that Cale brought to the band um, was, first of all, that sort of experimental philosophy, while meanwhile, uh, while John Cale was kind of a, a virtuoso uh, and a very well-trained musician, Lou Reed was a pure rock and roller, um, complete bonehead when it came to, uh, as a musician, like, I mean, Lou Reed is not an amazing guitarist, technically, but in fact, he's a very underrated guitarist, I feel, um, in terms of the invention that he brought uh, to the instrument. And in the meantime, he's sort of flanked uh, with his uh, foil, Sterling Morrison, who alternated between, between bass and guitar, no slouch on either instrument either. But nonetheless, um, one of the things that attracted Cale to Lou Reed uh, was that Lou Reed used to play with a tuning called the Ostrich Tuning. Uh, the Ostrich Tuning is in fact a guitar that is just set up to one note. Uh, all the strings are tuned to, uh, we'll say, D or C, any note you like, really. It was, it was really Lou Reed's, well, it wasn't really Lou Reed's invention, he pinched it off somebody else, but he used it to some effect uh, in a single called Do the Ostrich. Uh, what it means is you can just simply play like that and you'll, you'll hear all the same note. Um, and it kind of creates a ruckus. Uh, the problem with the ostrich guitar is that the legend of the ostrich guitar precedes itself, so much so that every single bloody journalist who doesn't have a clue what they're at uh, and some musicians uh, are pretty convinced the ostrich guitar features wholesale uh, in songs such as 
Venus and Furs, uh, Heroin, you take your pick. Um, but in actual fact, uh, based on the detective work I've done, um, the Ostrich Guitar features on very little of the first, or indeed the second, Velvet Underground record. And I think it's been used as a sort of gimmick um, to kind of uh, push the, the legend of the band further or their popularity, etc. And I'll explain why, um, how I've come to that conclusion now. And without sort of setting this guitar up for an ostrich, which I might do. Um, but first of all, let me just explain one song, Venus and Furs. So that's the first one I want to kind of... Um, but before I go to Venus and Furs, I'm going to just talk a little bit about another song called Run Run Run. Uh, Run 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 is just a very straightforward blues number. It's almost like they're doing, uh, I don't know, they're playing homage to their uh, blues forefathers. And um, the other thing about the Velvet Underground actually is, and you may not see this, but on this guitar, which is a Telecaster copy, uh, which I used to play a lot when I was uh, playing in bands in the 90s, um, and I read that the Velvet Underground used to play with higher gauge strings because in fact, whereas most bands would tune to an E on their guitar, the Velvet Underground would tune to D, so uh, what we'd say one whole step down, or to E flat and that's just half a step down, right? That's important uh, because the gauge of strings on your guitar will completely transform how it sounds, depending. Um, but if you are gonna get uh, heavy gauge strings, or you're thinking of experimenting that way, uh, do be careful with that because you might want to go and talk to Luthier or someone in your guitar shop uh, to make sure the strings you're putting on your guitar are not going to change the setup, the dynamic of the guitar. This guitar actually, I mean, it, it's not great. Uh, the action's very high on it, uh, and the neck, yeah, it's not probably, the, the, they're a bit too heavy. I've overdone it, uh, overcooked it. But anyway, I'm gonna just play you a chord here so you can hear that. Uh, this is the difference. It's kind of growly. Whereas, uh, I'm just gonna plug in another guitar right beside me, which is the Jazz Master that I frequently play with. This is called Old Man Blues. Uh, so uh, it's a pitch up, you can hear it's an E. Uh, but again, it's, I don't know if that comes through on the video, um, but it's nowhere near as sort of growly or as intense as uh, what I have on this guitar. And actually, when you think about it, you know, in songs like Run Run Run, where there's no bass on it, it simply means that with those two guitars um, running uh, side by side in the same uh, pitch, stomp but the other thing that is happening in that song is in fact quite curious and um, is that the top string of both guitars at least in the recording is tuned to a, uh, a C so it's one step down again oh not a C to a B haha <laughs> They're both an A. And then you get this kind of twangy sound, uh, this drone. Um, when you consider where John Cale was coming from, it's perfect. This is exactly uh, what they were probably looking at or he was looking at. And it's a bit of a similar nod to the ostrich guitar, but it's not a full ostrich guitar. It's just that. Now, this is... If you're familiar with the record, immediately that's the sound of the... Uh, um, and which Lou Reed is sort of uh, riffing, um, lyrically at least. But again, um, when uh, it comes to Lou Reed playing solo, then he's able to use just his finger. gets that to the sound but it also means that everything else is, is the standard tuning is open to him and that 
that's that's a very uh, I think a very clever uh, invention, which is kind of a little bit of a nod to the ostrich guitar and that he's willing to uh, to experiment with detuning a string, which is not an amazing uh, a major thing, but it does uh, add this uh, dynamic, which is interesting. Now. What is also interesting is that I've never found a bootleg with a Velvet Underground playing in that tuning. Uh, if someone knows of one, then put me, put me wide to it. I'm really happy to hear it. Um, but I think it's just on that record. And it kind of makes me wonder if it's possible that all that tracking was done by Lewis. Lou, Lewis uh, and that Sterling Morrison was not necessarily involved in the guitar playing of that uh, particular tune. Um, because remember Lou Reed had worked in a um, uh, studio before, he knew exactly how to sort of run things very fast. Uh, he'd always talk about himself being able to work in the studio very quickly. Uh, and it's very possible that this was filler on the Banana album. Uh, and I don't know if it was written kind of for the record or if it was something they were playing before as part of their shows. That would be interesting to find out. Uh, but I can imagine that they could easily have walked into the studio with about five songs, say, when they decided to record a record. And there is our producer Tom Wilson saying you're going to have to expand a little bit more to get to an album. The next thing then, uh, which kind of is a bit of an ostrich is just back up again. This string is tuned to C, which I promised earlier on. Um, now, the advantage of this is the minute you hear this chord, um, you might know which territory you're in if you're very familiar with the underground. If you're not, then um, I'll explain. It's uh, the chord from uh, only uh, <laughs> from Venus and Furs. Um, the end chord, actually, importantly. Uh, so if you. That's the signature riff, but the other thing that Re Lewis is doing is uh, intermittently he's got these kind of um, progressions, which is like you have to listen carefully for it. You'd probably be fooled into thinking that all it is is this sort of Indian style riff. doing there is I'm playing the top of an F chord but it has immediately you can hear that and I think that Lou there's an article where he read he's saying that he could have trend he could have pulled it this way I think he might have pushed up rather than pulled down I'm not sure um, but then when it what he's doing is just playing the top of the chord but actually if you listen carefully and you've got a good pair of headphones or noise cancelling headphones you can hear occasionally where he hits the top string um, and that's Venus and Furs. It's not an ostrich guitar so uh, everyone like Mick Wall and all the other tossers out there who think they know where they're at um, this is actually the truth. There is no ostrich guitar in Venus and Furs. It's impossible to play a, a chord in an ostrich guitar. Why? Because the intervals, uh, there's just not enough, um, not enough opportunity to generate intervals. Now, I will show you what happens when we do tune. We're in business. ostrich do the ostrich but when you play uh, that and again Venus and Furs could you play it no I well I mean you could but it wouldn't sound the same so but one song that it is used in is all tomorrow's parties uh, and there is video of Lou Reed playing this on their reunion tour, and this is how I know he's using his thumb for this particular piece. Um, and he's also got... Which is a beautiful riff um, that 
he's added. And the other thing about it is that he's able to solo very similar to what he was doing in Run Run Run. back to the lower strings and he does this. So the entire song, um, it takes on a very different texture. When you hear the original demos, he's using standard chords. Uh, and then he obviously ditches it at some point uh, for the ostrich guitar, and I think that that is really extraordinary. Now, whether that was something that Kale prompted or uh, prompted him to do, because um, Kale, of course, had the ability to arrange. Uh, very hard to know. I doubt Kale wants to talk about it because I think he's busy trying to be John Kale, and I think he probably has been trying to be John Kale for the last fifty years, and people keep dragging him back in. Uh, to the Vowel Underground. Um, the only other song I think that this may be on, but I think it's a bit of a stretch actually, is uh, Lady Godiva. But it's. It's possible, but again, it might be possible that Louis was using his um, trick that he used on songs like Run Run Run. So, if you're not bored yet, I've got one more for you. Another famous song uh, that Louis wrote in the Vogel Underground is a song called Rock and Roll. Um, I've seen this taught online in various different ways. Uh, one that I was looking at there. And I'm not going to call out the guy because uh, he is a good instructor. Um, I just happen to think he's wrong on this. Um, but I think he's overcomplicating a by playing bar chords. And it's fine, you know. You can do it that way. I think it's possible, but... Uh, I kind of prefer my way, which is that uh, uh, now it's in C, and the reason it's in C again is because we're using that sort of step down uh, tuning, the valve underground, and we're also doing a drop D, drop C. I apologize. We're dropping the D, what is now a low D, to a low C. Um, and what that enables us to do is this. Some people are inclined to perhaps overcomplicate this and say that he's playing, you know, a C and then he's playing this uh, C major seventh. It is a C major seven, but in fact, all that Lou is doing, because, you know, he's not really that bothered, it seems, with guitar, is he is just using one bloody finger to do that. And then up to the double dot and go up here. And then I guess on the second fret or in the whatever, fifth, fourteenth fret. He's now here's some evidence to shore that up so you know I'm not talking garbage. Here we go. So there's a bit in it where it sort of breaks down. tunings that I think the Velvet Underground were using, or at least Lou Reed was using. Um, and in fact, there's one video, uh, well, something you'll find on YouTube is a bootleg. It's been around for years. I only discovered it a while ago, which uh, shocked me. It's called the bootleg tape. It's the amp microphone. It basically what happened was the, um, someone left a microphone in Lou Reed's amp for a Velvet Underground gig, which means you have the entire gig tracked, or the bootlegs at least, with just uh, Lou Reed's um, guitar amped and it's uh, it's really worth listening to because uh, again you get a sense of how uh, kind of primitive he was as a player uh, but you certainly get a really strong feel for how expressive he was as a player and I think that 
uh, to be quite fair to Louis that he is due a little bit of credit uh, for having pushed the instrument perhaps further than what he was capable of technically uh, and then in doing so uh, created some fantastic tunes that he's left us with. Um, Louis turned, well his birthday was on the 1st of March which is celebrated there I think by Lenny Kay and a few others in New York uh, but this is my way of paying tribute to someone who was totally imperfect uh, not always very nice it seemed to people, I certainly have heard anecdotes myself, but left us with a great legacy of rock and roll. Thanks.